Thank you. It's really appropriate for Jess to introduce us. Um, hi, I'm Catherine. This is Sam and Chris. We sense that the SciPy vibe is, hey, we had a cool idea. We went and tried it, and here's what we learned along the way. A lot of folks in this room have thought and done great work in supportive education in, in the Python space, and we want to share some of the experience at Berkeley in our new, as of last year, data science curriculum. So you've got Sam and Chris and me here, and you see the rest of the, the team here. Um, and this is the whirlwind tour version. We want to hit several key things here, in part because we sense that there's different, different things that you can help us think about. We want to hit the overall vision for the program. I'll be talking about that. We'll talk about the tech and the infrastructure that enables it. That's Sam. And then there's an aspect of the program that's gotten a lot of attention, what we call the connectors. And that's Chris. And we'd love to have your thoughts both as folks working on Python and data and as people who care about teaching that next generation. That's the intersection that we're in, too. So we start with the students. This is a Berkeley lecture hall on the first day of class this spring. Berkeley is a large, diverse public university. About 6,000 freshman students show up at the campus each year, and we've begun building a data science program. This is a class from it that we hope will touch as many of our undergraduates as want to engage. We believe in doing things at scale. And so with the class that you see pictured here, we're reaching 1,000 of that 6,000 annually already in the first year, and we're expecting that it's going to grow. The academic year that we just finished, as I said, was the first year of the program. We're still somewhat on the outside of the university's regular organization. So what is this program? What's the vision? That's, that's a, a quicker overview that I want to do here. The ambitions of the program are we want to build a strong, intellectually substance-driven data science program in which working with techniques and tools is always in the concept, context of concepts and powerful, rigorous forms of thinking that are actually used in the doing of data science. We have an underlying sense here that data science is opening up a really important transformational moment in the disciplines of statistics and computer science and others as well. And we want to get that intellectual substance on view in our program. It's that intellectual ambition as much as anything else teaching ways of thinking computationally and inferentially and giving students a taste for them too. And we want to make it available to any undergraduate at Berkeley because reasoning in a data-rich world has become really a fundamental competency and a path to impact in a lot of domains. When we say from the ground up, that means we are starting with those freshmen. And then as those freshmen move forward, creating classes to accompany them as they go. That is, as they move, our, our aim is to be moving with them to creating the major and the minors that we hear from them that they want. The physics major who wants a data science minor, the environmental studies major who wants a data science minor, the ethnic studies major. We want to make the curriculum of broad, broad interest and tuned into the ethical and societal implications of working with data, and yes, we want to do it at scale. Now, we're not starting from the top with advanced statistics or machine learning. We're building the program from the bottom up, from the ground, from the foundations of the field. And I can run you through the design requirements for our entry-level course. No computer science background, only high school algebra. That's basic admissions criteria to Berkeley. Students need to get immediately into working with data by writing Python. We can't assume that the students all have computers. We can't require them to figure out how to do a local installation. And we want to provide a platform that they can build on as they move forward through their careers, whether they're data science majors or not. We want to draw them in, not because it's a requirement, because they want to be there. It does satisfy a bunch of statistics requirements across the campus already, though. So let me talk about the entry-level curriculum. Our architectural concept is a set of core and connection courses. What that means at the introductory level is a foundations of data science class. That's the one I showed you a picture of. And a set of connector courses. I'll talk a bit about the foundations course very briefly. The connectors are what Chris will talk about. And what I want to underline here is the symmetrical relationship between them. It's about coordination and feedback loops 
between a conceptual core in computer science information and statistics and the places where that conceptual core gets connected out to other fields. So our foundations class is called Data 8. It's cross-listed between computer science information and statistics. And you can pop through any of these links and see the syllabus, the textbook, which is on GitHub. Um, and I won't do that here, but invite you to do it because understanding it from the inside is really a, a core way to get a, 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 your head around what, what we're trying to do there. From the course description, we say foundations of data science combines three perspectives, inferential thinking, computational thinking, and real world relevance. Given data arising for some real world phenomenon, how does one analyze that data so as to understand the phenomenon? The course teaches critical concepts and skills in computer programming and statistical inference in conjunction with hands-on analysis of real-world data sets, including economic data, document collections, geographic data, and social networks. It delves into so social issues surrounding data analysis, such as privacy and design. And you can see you can click over to the syllabus and look at it. You can see some of the highlights of the course on the slide. We're seeking to convey understanding of concepts through manipulation and visualization that's different from learning statistical formulas to plug and chug. And you can run down the rest. I want to stress really the last point. The atmosphere is supposed to be empowering and supportive, and the interact button is kind of the theme. So Chris will be talking about the foundation, the, the connector courses that connect to the foundation. In addition to the 450 students in foundations, we had 11 connectors, um, human behavior, environment, cognitive science, data and ethics, statistical and computer science content. And the students who we had are very broadly distributed across campus, across majors, start large proportion of females, and we have information about what their intended majors are, and we do see that they are very interested in continuing. So how do we do this? This is where I transition to the folks who are actually doing it. With a whole lot of help, the Jupiter team is in Berkeley. <laughs> we have an amazing student team. We have help from Intel and Microsoft and Google, and of course, we're using Jupyter Notebooks. And here I want to hand it over to Sam to talk about the tech infrastructure. Cool, hello. Can you guys hear me in the back? Cool, my name is Sam. I've been helping teach the foundations class for the past year, and I also spend a lot of time working on the technology and the infrastructure behind the class. There's my slide. All right, so today I'm gonna to specifically talk about how, or why we use Jupyter Hub, how we do it at scale for hundreds of students and possibly more, passing current issues along with our future direction with the technology. So as Catherine mentioned, our goal is to teach data, students data science using Python. And this entails um, a lot of, using a lot of tools, a lot of tools that take a while to install. And so the question that we asked ourselves at the beginning was, how do we get students up and running doing data science work as quickly as possible? A lot of classes at Berkeley who do use some similar technology spend a lot of time working through installation issues, figuring out which kernel version produces which errors on which packages, um, trying to work out Windows, don't get me started. And we wanted to avoid all of that, so we turned to Jupyter Hub instead. Jupyter Hub is a project by the Jupyter team that lets multiple people use one shared Jupyter, um, essentially managed Jupyter setup. Students can access their own URL, which for our students is data8.berkeley.edu, get their own notebook environment, and more importantly, we can add packages at will, we can update packages, and that's, this is transparent to the student. They don't have to deal with any of these issues, and we, we shoulder the burden ourselves. A high-level overview of how Jupyter Hub works, uh, minus like, basically every detail except the main ones, is if we have, say, a two-student class, we can run Jupyter Hub on one computer. These two students can access that computer and access their notebooks through that one computer. And I'm, missing, I'm omitting a lot of details for the sake of time, but you can see that, for example, if we, I can add a package to that one main computer, and, all, and both Sam and Chris will get the update to the package. So how do we scale to more students? Suppose we have 100 students. If we give each student two gigabytes of RAM, this means we need a computer with 100 cores and 200 gigabytes of RAM, which is a pretty beefy computer. 
given that we want to scale this infrastructure to thousands of students, and we're not on the market for supercomputers anytime too soon, we wanted something that was more scalable. And this is where we really depended on the work of other people, some of whom are in this room. So Jessica Hamrick, who's here, um, Min and Kyle Kelly worked on a Jupyter Hub deployment for 200 students, which was, in, which was used in a class at Berkeley. And we basically copied their deployment for our use. So the change in architecture is, instead of having one computer do all the work, we distribute the load across multiple computers, pretty simply stated. And instead of having one computer handle all the students, we instead have a bunch of computers that can each handle, say, like 10 or 20 students at a time. And that way, we can handle more and more students as a class grows. Now again, there are a lot of details that I'm omitting from these slides. And I don't have the time to go into these details in this presentation. And there are a lot of subtleties that go into working at the details of this deployment. And I invite you to come talk to us after this presentation about it, if you're interested. So in the fall, we had um, about 100 students in the, in the foundations class. With our deployment, everything went pretty smoothly. And as you saw from the previous, from two slides ago, it seems like a pretty simple matter to handle more students, add more computers. And so in the spring, with, a, with about 450 students, we said to ourselves, we can just add more computers, and it'll be easy. And these turned out to be pretty, these turned out to be famous last words. And we started running into problems. Um, a couple of weeks into the spring semester, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. A couple of weeks into the spring semester, we started noticing students getting errors when they tried to log into Jupyter Hub. We made a form thread for these errors, and um, we had to soon close down that form thread because it got so long that it would crash your browser if you tried to load up that page. Um, <laughs> it turned out that that error happened because of a race condition in JupyterHub that was only revealed when we had hundreds of people using the system at the same time. And in our case, um, Min was a hero and stepped in and helped us like, work, out the, work out this issue. But after the issue happened, we kind of sat down and said to ourselves, gee, like, what, happens, what, what do we do if this happens again? Like, we can't have students being very sad about not being able to do their homeworks and projects for like two weeks. So um, this brings us to our current projects and where we're headed with this. So last semester, we worked on some work. We did some work on adding some monitoring to Jupyter Hub. So being able to see, um, for example, CPU usage, memory usage, and for example, the error rate at which stuff happens on Jupyter Hub so that when we push out a fix or a supposed fix, we can see whether the error rate goes down or if we made things like twice as bad. Um, we also started work on load testing, so simulating a bunch of students using Jupyter Hub at the same time, so we can hopefully catch bugs before they affect students. Going forward, our deployment has received um, our deployment has been working more or less okay for our class, and it's received the attention of some other classes at Berkeley who have stepped up and asked, "Hey, like we like to use this for our class too." And so on our plates is we're trying to scale up work to more classes by making the deployment easier, as opposed to I or another staff member spending a day typing commands in a remote terminal. Um, shared login and storage across multiple deployments. So if a student has different classes that use JupyterHub, they can have files go between all of those deployments and log in in one place. Deployments using different cloud providers, such as AWS or Azure or Google Cloud Compute, because classes have different resources at their disposal, we want to be able to serve all of them. And our end goal is for all classes to be able to get JupyterHub at the click of a button. And this is somewhat far in the future, but this is where, this is the future that we envision. I just linked to some slides here that I'm not gonna go over, but you can, you are, so please feel free to click on them if you have the time and go over the slides again. And more importantly, we would love to talk to you about deploying and developing JupyterHub. I'm gonna hand it over to Chris now to talk, to talk about the connector classes. All right, so um, while Sam has been mostly focusing on a lot of the technical challenges that we faced in creating this uh, Data 8 course, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, uh, more about sort of uh, maybe cultural or sociological considerations that we had to make as well. So first of all, why did we choose to use connector courses in the first place? Well, the main reason is that the foundations course is really teaching people a very general set of skills, but we find that it's, it's really useful to explore those skills in this specific context of a domain problem. 
Um, the other thing that's really useful about these sorts of classes is that it basically gives students who may not understand how their interests interface with data science an opportunity to, under, to, to explore ways that that might happen. So for example, if you're into literature or history, a lot of undergrads just assume that there's no way that they could do programming in the context of those fields. Um, and yet we had two connector courses that covered um, those very topics. Um, beyond that, what that allows you to do is start to expand the definition of what data science means for a lot of these students. Um, we all know that it's kind of a meaningless term anyway, but it's really useful to, to allow undergrads to see this you know, diverse world that is out there that they might want to explore further in their own research. And then finally, um, something that kind of came out of this is that it also allows us to get teachers from lots of different disciplines in the same room together. They're each teaching their own connector course, but they're all sort of sharing their ideas and their vision for how these sorts of courses might work. But as you can imagine, that sort of poses a challenge in and of itself, because you can't get 20 people in the same room and have them all agree with one another about exactly how they should be teaching their classes. You know, if you have someone from literature, someone from history, and someone from applied statistics, they all have a very different view of what data science means. Um, and our approach to this was really to treat this as a positive, not a challenge, um, to sort of leverage the diversity in our faculty and the diversity in anyone who was willing to teach these classes and try to get them to sort of learn from one another and make the whole thing better than the sum of its parts. So just as an example, we have sort of many different sorts of connector instructors, and I'm very much so simplifying this when I'm putting it on a 2D plot like that. But for example, we would have some connector instructors that were really heavy in statistics and theory, and they thought it was fine to just ask these freshmen who maybe had no math background that they could do you know, 10 proofs every night for their homework. Um, we had people who were sort of Python hacky gurus who expected that it was fine to ask their students to you know, modify SciPy source code or like monkey patch functions just at runtime when they're doing stuff. Um, we also had people who were really good at statistics and, and modeling and data analysis, but who only ever did this in the context of Excel, for example. And they had to learn Python in this sort of computational environment of Jupyter. And then finally, we also had uh, connector courses that were more purely conceptual. Um, they were interested in exploring the ways that, for example, data science interfaces with ethics and interfaces with our society more generally. Um, so again, the way that we tried to approach this was saying, you know, this is great that you have all of these different ways to tackle these kinds of problems, and we want you all to start talking to each other and sharing ideas and, you know, making one another's own approach that much better. So I just want to show you one example of what a connector course looks like. I'm going to show you some of the course materials that they use. Almost all of the connectors, especially the ones that were more sort of data heavy, used uh, Jupyter Notebooks, and all of their repositories are actually publicly online, and we'll have some links for that at the end of this talk. Um, to show you this, I'm also going to demo a really useful tool that Sam and his team built um, for, these, uh, for these connector instructors. They're called Interact Links, and they're basically a way for you to give students a link that they can click, and when you click on it, it'll dump you into a Jupyter Hub instance that's attached to your account. It will pull all of the materials from that repository for the class into your own file system, and then it will spin up uh, a Python kernel that you can immediately start interacting um, with this data. So for example, this is a class that covered, um, it was called Smart Cities. It basically covered the way that data is used for city planning and understanding what's going on inside of cities. Um, I just clicked that link, and now you'll see it's a Jupyter instance, but this is actually um, interacting with the computer that's over on UC Berkeley's campus right now. Um, and these are all notebooks that sort of span from the very beginning of the semester to the very end of the semester. As you can see, at the very beginning of the class, students are studying pretty rudimentary things. They're just understanding what is data, what does data look like inside of a computer, um, what does it mean in the context of a city. I think this is uh, traffic congestion on the San Francisco Bay Bridge. Um, and so they're just sort of starting to get the very, the very beginning of, of an idea of what they could do. However, um, by the time you get to later weeks, um, you're doing much more sophisticated kinds of things. So this is at the very end of the class, and now they're doing uh, clustering methods to try and see if you can detect um, different patterns of activity in electric vehicle drivers. So this is something that is much more complicated than just understanding what a matrix is, but it's something that they were able to get up to by iteratively building over the course of that week from the instructor. 
So I've also got a link there to a literature connector course, which itself was its own challenge. They explored things like latent Dirichlet allocation and, how to and topic modeling and sort of understanding how you can analyze text with a lot of these methods. And again, that sort of opened a lot of students' eyes to what the possibilities were for these computational methods. So we learned a lot of things um, over the course of this, um, of this experiment. And I think really the main thing that I want to highlight is you really want to treat diversity as a strength, not as a weakness. It's not a challenge to overcome. It's like a, something that you should leverage and something that you should use to make everybody a little bit better. Um, I'm not going to go through the rest of these in the sake of time. But as I said before, uh, we have materials uh, that we've linked to throughout this talk. And I've also got a link down here, which is sort of a, a, a guide that we put together for the connector instructors um, to help them to guide them through the process. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Catherine to finish up. Yeah, because the, the closing slide is a whole bunch of thanks to the faculty and the staff and the students who built this program to Fernando and the whole Jupyter team because between the notebooks and the help that they gave with Jupyter Hub, the program truly would not have happened last year without them. To the Berkeley Institute for Data Science, which has provided a, a wonderful welcoming home for the team. And thank you to you for listening. Come and give us your thoughts. Ask us questions now or tell us what you think we can be doing better because you're also deeply concerned about this too, I'm sure. It's the next generation of our students. So, thank you. Okay, we have time for a few questions. Uh, all right, I'll take one over here and then I'll take the other mic over there. Who was it? Who had it? Um, so I've done a lot of hiring with uh, uh, data scientists, and one of the issues we've noticed with people coming out of boot camps and these types of programs, these accelerated programs that are geared towards data science, is a lot of the candidates really seem to be lacking skills in creative problem solving and being able to carry out a project from start to finish on their own. Um, and a lot of these programs have claimed things uh, like yours is about being very pro project focused and all of that um, and don't seem to really have delivered. Uh, so what are you guys kind of doing to try and address those types of issues? Um, yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. And uh, in a lot of ways, that's a situation where the sort of connector courses can really excel um, because they do have a specific world that they tend to care about. And, um, we don't tell the instructors exactly what they have to do, but many of them basically took a project-based approach to their connectors. They spent the first few weeks teaching people about the general uh, foundations of their field, the kinds of questions that people found interesting, and then they sort of turned their students loose and asked them to try to come up with interesting questions of their own, and they would kind of layer on more complicated components to those questions as the semester uh, went along. So I think a lot of the instructors appreciate the value in that. And when we had meetings, we would have sort of group meetings with instructors every so often. And a lot of them would sort of preach that uh, students really enjoyed that kind of approach. Um, it gives them a, a feeling of accomplishment and it also does allow them to think about kind of the whole process from start to finish instead of getting like a nice clean data set. Yeah. Uh, so, so the next question that we're asking is, so what happens when you get beyond entry level? because clearly as this curriculum grows, if that's something that's so key to student learning, how do we enable it at scale? Because project work is also labor intensive from the point of view of supervision. Okay, um, I had a question just on my campus. I'm trying to find other people who are doing data science in applied domains. How did you find your collaborators? Because um, I can't seem to find any on my campus. I think you're asking for advice rather than actually knowing how we did it. Um, it. It helps that we have one place called the Berkeley Institute for Data Science that people at least think they can come to. The other thing is I, I am a historian and ethnographer, so I've been getting to know these people for about five years, and so most of the, most of the early connections that we made were just through individual personal knowledge, even getting to know people at you know daycare pickup, that kind of thing. I, see, it's not easy to generalize except to say it is one one to one meeting people. I, I have a question which is a little more on the technical side. Um, 
so all everything you've built is basically using cloud services, like um, you know stuff like that. Unfortunately, I work for a government agency which is not allowed to use cloud services. Could I? In, is how complicated would be would it be to get this infrastructure on an HPC system or something internal? Yeah. So actually, our first deployment of Jupyter Hub was on our bare, our bare metal machines in the computer science department. Um, the way the deployment was written was that it's it's pretty like platform agnostic in that it requires some configuration depending on your like what what type of computers you have. But other than that, it's made to just to ideally work anywhere. And so um, we hope that like we're trying to address that as well as addressing other cloud providers as well. Okay, um, I think we should probably stop here so that people can come in for lightning talks. But um, thank you so much. Let's give another round of applause.